जमून धीरे राहान राहियों जाय राधम भागवा कुंज विहाहिया हे जाय राधम भागवा कुंज विहाहिया Back to the basics. Okay, Bhagavad Gita. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So uh, this is chapter 9, verse 34. This chapter is entitled The Most Confidential Knowledge. Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto Madhyaji Mam Namaskuru Mam Me Vaisyasi Yuktaivam Atmana Mad Parayanaha Manmana Bhava Mad Bhaktohu Madhyaji Mam Namaskuru Mam Me Vaisyasi Yaktaivam Atmana Mad Parayanaha Manmana Bhava Mad Bhaktohu Mam Yaji Mam Namaskuru Mam Me Vaisyasi Yuktaivam Atmanam Mat Parayanaha Krishna says, always thinking of me, Baba, become Mad, my, Bhakta, devotee, Mat, my, Yaji, worshipper, Mam, unto me, and Namaskuru, offer obeisances, Mum, unto me, Eva, completely, Aishyasi, you will come, Yuktva, being absorbed, Evam, thus, Atmanam, your soul, Madparayanaha, devoted to me. So this is the concluding verse in this chapter. Engage your mind always thinking of me, become my devotee, offer obeisances to me and worship me, being completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. Hmm. The purport is a little long, so we'll take it in parts. In this verse is a complete indicated 
that Krishna consciousness is the only means of being delivered from the clutches of this contaminated world. Sometimes unscrupulous commentators distort the meaning of what is clearly stated here, that all devotional service should be offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Unfortunately, unscrupulous commentators divert the mind of the reader to that which is not feasible. Such commentators do not know that there is no difference between Krishna's mind and Krishna. So what is Prabhupada referring to here? He's referring to a particular incident that happened where he was reading this verse before Prabhupada had his actual Gita. He was using a Gita by another spiritualist, I think, can't remember uh, who it was. Ra uh, Dr. Radhakrishna, yeah. So in using that Gita, uh, he had one of his disciples, who was actually Kirtananda Swami, read the verse and then read the commentary by Radhakrishna. And when he read the verse and then he commented, he said, it's not to the, it's not to Krishna that we have to surrender to, but it's the unborn, unmanifested, indwelling sense of the person, Krishna, which is complete word jugglery. <laughs> when Prabhupada heard that, he became like Nishringadev. <laughs> he took his fist and slammed it on the desk where he was. Just see. Krishna's saying to surrender to me, it's clear, and he's saying it's not to Krishna you have to surrender. And Prabhupada went on for a long time just smashing this. So in the beginning of this purport, which is the same verse he was commenting on, he makes that point, unscrupulous commentators distort the real meaning and give some, uh, what we say, interpretation that is not at all feasible. So because he says there's no difference between, there's no difference between Krishna's mind and Krishna, he's not an ordinary being. So this commentator was saying, well, it's not to Krishna, but the indwelling sense that lives within Krishna. So he made a distinction between Krishna and his, his body and him. And then on the absolute platform, spirit is not divisible. It's absolute. So Krishna's body and Krishna are non-different. Krishna doesn't change his body. His body is him. It's all pure spiritual. It's the same with us. Our body, our spiritual body is who we really are. And we have, there's no difference in our, don't sit like that. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, there's no difference between um, the uh, soul and the form of the soul. It's the same. But when we take on a material body, we get a distinction, and the body is not us. It's a covering over the real soul. And so from the material point of view, body and soul, are different, but from the spiritual point of view, there's no distinction, nor is there any nomenclature or description that describes the distinction between the soul and something that is of the soul. It's all absolute. That's clear? Yeah. Makes sense? Okay. So Prabhupada was really uh, strong and this is the one of the qualities of Srila Prabhupada. He didn't tolerate wrong understanding of Krishna. Um, sometimes people would become a little disturbed by Prabhupada's strong reactions to such statements, thinking that he's becoming, you know, too harsh or too strong or too something. Mm -hmm. But when you develop love for someone and they describe that person that you love in the wrong way, that love turns into what we say a strong reaction to defend the lover and to defend the concept 
of what is actually truth. So Prabhupada's re strong reaction was both to establish the truth, but when you talk about Krishna to a pure devotee, that touches the heart. So if it's not right, they're going to be disturbed because there is a loving relationship there. If somebody talks about somebody you love in a wrong way, you become a little, you become naturally become upset because of the love. <laughs> you know, in the same way, we should understand that Prabhupada's strong reaction was based on his loving relationship with Krishna, along with teaching the principle of uh, truth. <laughs> Okay, so we'll go on. Krishna's mind, Krishna is not an ordinary human being, although he has a form like us. He is an absolute truth. His body, his mind, he himself are one and the absolute. It is stated in the Kurma Purana, as quoted by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami in his Anubhasya commentary on Chaitanya Charitamrita, chapter. 5 Adi Lila verses 41 through 48 Deha Dehi Vibedo Yam Neshvaram Vidyate Kachit. This means that there's no difference in Krishna, the Supreme Lord, between himself and his body. Because the commentaries do not know this science of Krishna, they hide Krishna and divide his personality from his mind or from his body. Although this is sheer ignorance of the science of Krishna, some men make profit out of misleading people. You can see Prabhupada how much time he spent just explaining this one point. Because, you know, it was a, he was really disturbed. There are some who are demonic, and they also think of Krishna, but enviously, just like King Kamsa, Krishna's uncle. He was also thinking of Krishna always, but he thought of Krishna as an enemy. He was always in anxiety, wondering whether Krishna would come to kill him. This kind of thinking will not help us. One should be thinking of Krishna in devotional love, that is bhakti. One should cultivate the knowledge of Krishna continuously. It's not that we develop some little bit of knowledge of Krishna, we leave that. And we, Krishna is unlimited, the knowledge of Krishna about Krishna is unlimited. So whatever we know is very limited. So whatever we can gain is to our credit to know more and more about Krishna. Mm -hmm. what, what is that favorable cultivation? So Prabhupada gives a question. It is to learn from a bona fide teacher. So this point is being made over and over again, you have to learn the knowledge from a teacher. And a teacher who is required, qualified to teach. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And we have several times explained that his body is not material, but is eternal, blissful knowledge. This kind of talk about Krishna will help one become a devotee. Understanding Krishna otherwise from the wrong source will prove fruitless. Yeah. So there's people who like to go to other sources to try to get information or knowledge about Krishna. But a lot of those sources don't have the knowledge themselves. As Prabhupada makes the point, you cannot speculate about what is the nature of God. Not, knowledge of God is not a process of mental speculation, conjecture, empirical observation, uh, personal experience. Knowledge of Krishna or knowledge of the Absolute comes from the Absolute through the disciplic succession, which are a line of bona fide teachers. And none of that, those teachers are in contrary with the previous teacher, they are all giving the same understanding, although they may use different language. <laughs> but the knowledge has to come in that way. Otherwise, if it doesn't, you'll get something less than what is truth, or you maybe get something that is completely wrong. <laughs> 
One should therefore engage his mind in the eternal form, the primeval form of Krishna, with, with conviction in his heart that Krishna is the supreme. One should worship him, one should engage in his worship. There are hundreds and thousands of temples in India for the worship of Krishna and devotional services practiced there. When such practice is made, one has to offer obeisances to Krishna. So here's one of the points being made in the verse. One has to offer obeisances to Krishna. One should lower his hell head before the deity and engage his mind, his body, his activities, everything. That will make one fully absorbed in Krishna without deviation. And sometimes we say, if you don't feel humble, act humble. <laughs> it's not a matter of feeling, oh, I don't feel humble today. I don't feel like offering obeisances. And so I have to f be true to myself and go along with how I feel. Feelings are, can come and go. They can come and go within a few moments. So we have to act according to what is right and not according to how we feel or how we don't feel. So offering obeisances to the Lord is required every time we are in front of the Lord in front of his deity form like that. And that helps us to develop the right mood. So here Prabhupada said, that will make one fully absorbed in Krishna without deviation. This will help one transfer to Krishna Loka. One should not be deviated by unscrupulous commentators. So he, Prabhupada, you can see how disturbed he was about this. <laughs> He's not going to let up. <laughs> one must engage in the nine different processes of devotional service, beginning with hearing and chanting about Krishna. Pure devotional service is the highest achievement of human society. And this is corroborated in Srimad Bhagavatam by Yamaraj himself, when he instructs his uh, his Yamadutas after they came back from their failure to take the soul of um, of Ajamil to Yamaraj, and then they explained what happened, and he, then Yamaraj explained that out of all the activities within human society, devotional service is the supreme of all activities. And within that activity, the chanting of the holy name is the topmost of all of the activities of devotional service. The seventh and eighth chapters of Bhagavad Gita have explained pure devotional service to the Lord that is free from speculative knowledge, mystic yoga, and fruit of activities. So this is speculative knowledge. Uh, people study different philosophical terms and then they conclude accordingly. Mystic yoga through the various types of meditation, dr drilling the respiration, you know, pranayama and all. And fruit of activities, performing activities with some desired des result. Those who are not purely sanctified may be attracted by different features of the Lord while the impersonal Brahma Jyoti and localized Paramatma, but a pure devotee directly takes to the service of the Supreme Lord. So the Lord Prabhupada is making the point. The absolute truth consists of impersonal Brahman, localized Paramatma, but the devotees are interested in the personal form of the Lord and not so much in the other aspects of the absolute truth. There is a beautiful poem by Krishna in which is clearly stated that any person who engages in worship of demigods is most unintelligent and cannot achieve at any time the supreme award of Krishna. Hmm. So Prabhupada is directing his statement towards mostly the Indian culture where demigod worship is quite profuse. Everywhere people worship demigods. They may worship Krishna also but they include Krishna as one of the forms of worship along with the demigods. And many times they don't make distinctions in hierarchy. They say worship is worship. And sometimes it becomes so, what we say, ludicrous or ridiculous that they include family members along with that worship. You go on, uh, I've been to many places 
where I've been to Indian homes where you have pictures of Krishna, Durga, Shiva, uh, Ganesh, and their grandfather. It's all on the same altar. <laughs> and so they all worship all of these considered that it's not so much the individual, but it's the principle of worship that's important. <laughs> so you'll find that, and that's why Prabhupada wants to make this clear, that those who worship other forms are not actually worshiping the Supreme. The Supreme has to be worshiped distinct from the other forms and knowing that these other forms of the Absolute Truth or other forms of the spiritual realm are simply expansions or manifestations of Krishna in different forms for different purposes, like that. So a, dis a distinction in worship has to be there, otherwise. Yatamata Tatapata was a famous statement by one spiritualist. I'm okay, you're okay. That's what it means, Yatamata Tatapata. I'm okay, you're okay, you worship, I worship, we all worship. Worship is, is what it's all about. So as long as you worship. So they worship their boss, sometimes they worship their dog. <laughs> People in Western countries like to do puja to their dog, so much so that they carry a little paper bag with them so when the dog has to do his thing, they make sure that the puja is done completely. <laughs> And everything is uh, done nicely, and the dog is smiling, knowing that he's in charge. <laughs> yeah, become servant of the dog. They think that I'm the, the dog is serving me, but when you actually understand what's happening, you'll see it's the opposite. <laughs> okay. Um, hmm. The devotee in the beginning may sometimes fall from the standard, but still he should be considered superior to other philosophers and yogis. One who always engages in Krishna consciousness should be understood to be a perfectly saintly person. So this is the uh, a supreme position of devotional service. As Prabhupada would say, as long as you're engaged in devotional service, you are on the liberated platform. You may not experience that, but because you're in that energy, you are free from the effects of the three modes of material nature. As you continue, mam chayo vyapi charena bhakti yogena sevate, sagunam sanvatit yaitam brahma bhuyaya kalpate, when that devotional service becomes absorbing or complete, continuous, then one can understand the difference between the material energy and the spiritual energy as one is diving deeply into the spiritual energy like that. So um, that's an experience. But a lot of times, although we're engaged in devotional service, we don't really have that realization, but it's a fact. Devotional service is pure. It's the internal energy of the Lord. It has nothing to do with the external energy. And so those who are engaged in devotional service are in that energy. And until the consciousness becomes purified, one may not experience the happiness of that. But gradually, gradually, as we stay within that mood, that changes and then we can understand the difference we can experience the difference. Here it says here, one who always engage, should be honest, okay, his accidental non-devotional activities will diminish. So somehow if one makes a mistake in devotional service, that was made in the previous verses, it's not so important. He will soon become a devotee and um, he will be again in complete perfection. The pure devotee has no actual chance to fall down because the Supreme Lord takes care of his pure devotees. Therefore, the intelligent person should take directly to the process of Krishna consciousness and happily live in the material world. 
he will eventually receive the supreme award of Krishna. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports of the ninth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita in the matter of the most confidential knowledge. So this chapter is considered to be the most confidential knowledge in Gita. Hmm. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So it's, it, the difference between the different processes of spiritual life and bhakti yoga is in bhakti yoga you get the help of Krishna Krishna is there to support you, Krishna is there to guide you, Krishna is there to uh, um, instruct you, Krishna is there to, you know, he's there for his devotee. Where in the other process, karma yoga, jnana yoga, or all of the other forms of yoga, you're on your own. In other words, it's you and the process, and you have to make it work. And it's by your effort you're successful in that process. But in bhakti, even if there's some lack or if there's some something that is not there that is needed, and Krishna says, never mind, just stay engaged in devotional service. I carry with you lack, I preserve with you have. So the element of Krishna's presence as a supportive effort in our devotional service is a big factor and a big distincting factor between karma, other the other yogas and bhakti yoga. And there's no chance of not being successful in bhakti yoga. The only way you cannot be successful in bhakti yoga is if you give up. As long as you stay in the process, even if there's some fall down or some mistake or whatever happens, Simply pick oneself up and again engages in the process. That's what's mentioned in the earlier verses. That even if one commits in the wrong activity, if they engage in devotional service, they're considered to be saintly. And again, they can reestablish their supreme position in devotional service. So this is the beauty of devotional service. And uh, devotional service uh, requires just sincerity. Sincerity leads to wanting to do the right thing. Sincerity lead, leads to wanting to accumulate, or not accumulate, but to develop transcendental knowledge of Krishna in the process of Krishna consciousness. Sincerity is mentioned in the nectar of devotion as the principle of success in devotional service. If I'm sincere, I will chant my rounds. If I'm sincere, I will hear the classes. If I'm sincere, I will associate with devotees. So sincerity really means to fine tune your life according to how you can progress in the process of devotional service. It's more than just a word, it's a principle of activity directed towards the goal that you're trying to achieve, which is, of course, prema pumar to maha, to develop our uh, attraction and our love for Krishna. That's actually... Now this verse, it's interesting because this verse is repeated again in the 18th chapter. The last two lines of the verse are different, but the essential principle of the verse is mentioned in the first two lines, where Krishna says the same thing Manmana Baba Mad Bhakta Mam Yuji Mam Namaskuru. And Srila Prabhupada describes that they, these are the four activities that make up the entire process of devotional service. Think of me, Krishna says, worship me, offer obeisances to me, what's the other one? And become my devotee. <laughs> These are the four activities. Engage your mind, become my devotee, offer obeisances, and worship me. So all of the principles of devotional service are in those four 
if you as I use the example, we unpack these four, and you'll find all of the categories, all of the activities are mentioned in these four. Thinking of Krishna, uh, the dedicating our life to Krishna, in other words, becoming Krishna's devotee, offering obeisances, although that means seems to be a little bit less uh, complex than the rest of them, it's mentioned because it's important. This principle of also obeisances is so important. Um, Prabhupada was at one temple and the devotees were, you know, there was a program going on. So at one point, everybody offered obeisances. And there was one gentleman there. He didn't offer obeisances. I guess he was a guest. And he came and he questioned Prabhupada. He came to him personally and asked him, why are they all doing that? And Prabhupada said, if you do it, you will also benefit. <laughs> So he, Prabhupada wanted to explain that, you know, this is a very essential principle of devotional service. And it should be done in the right mood. And the mood is the mood of submission and humility. The process of the act itself should be complete. Sometimes we uh, are in a hurry or just, we might say sometimes just a little bit lax. And we don't really offer obeisances. We chant the mantra real fast, and we don't even chant the mantra at all. When Prabhupada was uh, instructing his disciples who were doing personal service, uh, he taught them that when you come in to do the service, you offer your obeisances. And when you leave, you also do that. Prabhupada was teaching this principle using himself as an example. But then he saw his devotees who were doing the service, they were just quickly putting their head to the floor and immediately coming back up. Prabhupada said, N not hatchet. You know what a hatchet is? For cutting wood. We call it an ax sometimes. So you go, chuk, chuk. <laughs> no hatchet, chuk, chuk. <laughs> In other words, it should be done in the right mood. And then we chant the mantra to the spiritual master, in this case, Srila Prabhupada. And actually, and then of course nobody does it, I don't even do it myself, but it should be done loudly. And when you offer obeisances, it should be loud. So everyone hears when you're chanting, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya. Utale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine. So we feel maybe a little embarrassed at to chant it out loud, but and hardly anyone does it out loud, but that's that's actually the way to do it, <laughs> as mentioned in the in the instructions given. So this obeisances is very important, and it's a very essential point of, out of the four principles, it's mentioned as one of the most important principles, offering obeisances. And then the last one, Krishna says, worship me, engage in different types of worship. So when any, anything we do in relationship to the deity, whether we're in the temple room or we're on the altar, that is considered to be activities in the mood of worship. Like that. So these four activities are mentioned, and when something is mentioned twice or even three times, you can understand it has some importance. So this verse, especially the first two lines, again Krishna says in 1865. You can, it's and it's interesting. The ninth chapter and the eighth, eighteenth chapter which is the halfway point, is the ninth chapter, and then the 18th chapter is the ending point. Krishna says it again. Here he says again, Manmana bhava mad bhakto mam yuji mam namaskuru mam ivaishasi satyam te pratijino priyosi. Always think of me, become my devotee, 
Worship me and offer your homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. So this is the most confidential knowledge, these four principles. And as we practice devotional service, we will see that every activity in devotional full service is connected with one or more of these four activities like that. But the most important one here, we might say, is to uh, remember Krishna always. We might even say become his devotee. They're both important. But as we, as we perform our activities through the day, um, it is important to not only do the activity, but to remember Krishna. Generally, it's understood that when a person comes to Krishna consciousness, they are not so much inclined or not so much able to remember Krishna, but they're absorbed in the service of Krishna. But as one progresses in devotional service, it becomes more natural to think of Krishna while you're serving Krishna. And then remember Krishna in different ways throughout the day. And not simply only the activity, because by remembering Krishna, we also understand that this activity we're performing is for Krishna's pleasure. And that makes the activity, uh, what we say, perfect or complete. Sometimes devotees don't know why they're doing what they're doing. <laughs> well, why are you doing what you're doing? Because I was told to do it. <laughs> well, that's nice, and that's very good. That's a good, cre that's a good credit, but a, little better, a lot better than that is to understand the purpose behind the activity. And when we remember Krishna in the activity, the quality of that activity becomes so good. Like sometimes when I'm doing certain things, I play Srila Prabhupada's Japa tape. And while I'm, while I'm doing the activities, I'm listening to Prabhupada chant Japa. And I'm not even thinking about the activity so much. I'm, thinking, I'm just listening to the Japa. The activity seems to go on automatically without me even being so consciously aware of what I'm doing. I'm going through the motions, but because I'm connected to the sound vibration of something transcendental, the activity seems to be natural and without much effort. And that's the power of transcendental sound vibration. It lifts you completely into that atmosphere. And if you stay connected to that, you'll find that your activities just flow normally, mm -hmm. naturally, without so much effort. So these uh, four principles, this verse here, and of course Krishna again, confirms these same principles again in the 18th chapter. And Prabhupada in that particular verse, he, as opposed to this verse, Prabhupada is smashing <laughs> that one commentator. I mean, he, Prabhupada was really disturbed. <laughs> oh, was he disturbed. He smashed his fist on the table. Just see! <laughs> He was really angry. <laughs> Krishna is saying to me, and he's saying not to Krishna. <laughs> Prabhupada was really, he was really, and this was, you know, I, I think everybody who was there listening to Prabhupada was shaking when Prabhupada was, it was like the room was shaking. Sometimes when Prabhupada would get angry, it would feel, feel like the world was going to end right there, you know. <laughs> it's just like, whoa. <laughs> You, would, you couldn't move, you couldn't think, you couldn't talk, and you're like, oh, oh no. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like Krishna got, getting angry, you know, it's the same thing. <laughs> so yeah, well, so when Prabhupada, he carried that along when he wrote his commentary about this particular verse. But in the 18th chapter, he talks about that this is the essence of all spiritual activities, these four principles here. And in his lectures, when he comments on this verse, he makes that same point over and over. This is, this is the complete process of bhakti in this particular verse. All right, so... Uh, and then you'll go on to the 10th chapter. The 10th chapter 
and verses 8 through 11 are the, uh, what they call it, the nutshell verses. And these four, eight, 10, 8 through 10, 11. Nutshell means that these are the verses which expand the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. And that makes up the Gita. So the whole Gita is made up of these the principles based on these four verses. It expands itself out. And you get the whole philosophy in these four verses. Okay. Any questions or comments? We have a question from uh, internet. About in, the internet? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. And this is Avaduta Rai Das, and he's asking, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Srila Prabhupada, in more places writes how even a Kanishta can be on transcendental position. I cannot understand this because transcendental means above the three modes. But one is either under Mahamaya or Yoga, yoga Maya. Or perhaps there is a stage in between. And he has another question. Wait, one at a time. <laughs> that was a little complex. Kofrashani is a little complex. Uh, the answer to that question is that uh, we'd have to see the context by which Prabhupada is saying that in. He may make that statement, but then he sp explains it. So what is the explanation that comes along with those statements? So I don't really recall any of the statements that he's referring to, but anyone at any time can somehow or other tap into pre uh, an element of pure devotional service. In other words, you'll see sometimes a new person who comes into Krishna consciousness for the, and is just beginning can taste the happiness of pure devotional service because their mind and consciousness was in the right position at the right time. They experience that transcendental ex uh, happiness or experience but what usually happens is that after a while, when you stay in Krishna consciousness, then you you start thinking in the wrong way. <laughs> you start experiencing different things because you, you start seeing things differently. But when you first come in, you have no conception of what is right or what is wrong, and you're open to the energy. And because you're so wide open, you're able to experience uh, happiness and even transcendental knowledge that is available for those who are fixed on the spiritual platform. But it's not constant. It's just a quick experience. Like that. I think maybe if you all re think back to when you first joined, maybe you can remember what it was like. You had some really powerful experience at the beginning. Well, those experiences are real. It's not just like well, it's just like some feeling, but no. It's just because we're so open, so unassuming, that's the word. And then the whole energy just picks you right up because you're in the right consciousness. But sometimes, as explained by the Acharyas, when we stay in for a while, then we start thinking in the wrong way. And then we start blocking these experiences. <laughs> We start seeing the devotees as ordinary, the activities as ordinary. We start looking things in a more uh, mundane way. And that's what causes us. Now then we have to, again, try to open our consciousness up to that spiritual energy through proper understanding. So it's possible, yeah. There's no, pro, there's nothing in between yoga maya and maha maya. They that comprises. You're either in one or the other. <laughs> you, you, uh, maha maya ha, hides Krishna from those who are unqualified, and yoga maya hides Krishna in order to increase the devotion of his devotee or to play out a particular pastime of Krishna that Krishna wants to happen. There is another question. 
it, uh, it is interesting that chanting is more powerful than the remembrance of Krishna. But still, Krishna says, remember me. Any thoughts on this? Well, remembering, chanting means to remember Krishna. <laughs> it's the same thing. Hmm. Hmm. But if you remember Krishna, uh, as we mentioned here, remembering Krishna means chanting Hare Krishna. That's included in that process of remembering Krishna. It's the same thing. To remember Krishna, the chant Hare Krishna is the same. But you can remember Krishna in other ways too. You can think of his deity form. You can... What's another way to remember Krishna? Different ways. And when you taste prasadam cooked by, what's his name again? Ananda Varden? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you get an experience of Krishna consciousness. You think, oh, Krishna. And then that's remembering Krishna. <laughs> so there's different ways to remember Krishna. But chanting is one of the ways, and it's also the most recommended way. That's the only the, the distinction for expl by explanation, that's all. Anything else? Yes. Hare Krishna. Uh, on the internet is, uh, is nowadays very modern that you listen to some charismatic New Age guru. What you would answer if somebody asks you why do you why do you don't listen to these gurus? <laughs> they are basically talk nonsense or they are my bodies. Well, without criticizing them, I'm getting everything I need from this, the the source that I'm getting. Why do I why should I go somewhere else? I'm getting everything from Krishna, from Prabhupada from those who follow Krishna and Prabhupada, why do I have to go to people who are not connected to the source where I'm getting everything? Bhakti Charu Maharaj made that point very clearly in his writings and in his classes, Sri Panchatattva, that Prabhupada gave us everything. It's just a matter of understanding it and being exposed to it. Sometimes people think, well, there's something Prabhupada didn't give us. No, it's just a matter of you, you just need to investigate more deeply and you'll find that whatever question you have has been answered and explained by Srila Prabhupada. So, all right, so without criticizing them, we can say, you know, we have everything right here. Why should we go there? That's just what is called uh, wandering mind. The mind likes to wander from place to place. It's just restlessness of the mind, that's all. But then again, what is their authority? Are these people who are speaking, are they connected to disciplic succession? Are they actually Vaishnavas who are practicing? Or are they just some philosophical yogis that have studied scripture and can speak nicely and have good memories? It's not, you know, so there are people who are expert speakers because they also know how to memorize things. Memor memory, memorizing is a science. If you know how to memorize, you can memorize a lot of things. So they're good at memorization, they're good at speaking, they're good at saying something new that sounds interesting, and therefore people are attracted to something. But we get everything from, from Prabhupada. Why, do, why should we go somewhere else? And take a chance that we'll get something that is not correct, which is, a very, which is very likely to happen. Uh, I was more thinking about non devotees because they listen to the um, to the people because I think it's more uh, published or what you say more 
better advertised, you know, some, some spiritual groups. And they, they even don't come in contact with Hare Krishna, with disciples succession of Vaishnavas. Yeah, very few people come to Krishna consciousness. Only those who are actually intelligent. Prabhupada said, you know, Manusanam, the Bhagavad the scripture says, Manusanam Sahasrishu, Yasyat Yatadikitaye, Yatatam Abhisidhanam Kasjit Mam Veti Tat. Very few actually are looking for the real thing. People want something which is mixed spiritual material. They want to go on with their life and add some spiritual principles to it in order to improve their material life. That's generally the case. And sometimes, you know, even if we come to Krishna consciousness with, the, with these mixed desires, that's fine. But if you stay and actually understand what is the actual goal and what is the actual benefit, then you're intelligent. So you'll see many people come to our movement. In some temples, you can see, I, I used to, I travel a lot, and when I would travel, I'd go to one temple, and this temple was an example also, and I'd see a certain set of people, and then the next year I come and there's a different set. <laughs> and I come the next year and there's a different set. One or two are the same, not too many. <laughs> now because you're locked down, you can't escape this time. <laughs> so, but it, we find there's a lot of changeover because people come and then when they realize what it's about, they go. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's serious business. It's a process. <laughs> it's not something that you just, you know, jump into, get a little knowledge, a little happiness, and then you run to something else and try the same thing. No. It's a, that's why Krishna consciousness is, it's, Prabhupada said, when Prabhupada was asked about, you know, making the whole world Krishna conscious, Prabhupada said, it's not possible. He said, if we can make 10% of the world Krishna conscious, then we can, they can, they can gradually lead the rest of the world at least to the point of engaging in devotional service. Most people don't want <clears throat> to undergo the sacrifice that it takes to become Krishna conscious. And so they want something material or mixed spiritual material. Mm -hmm. Just the way, that's the way to wear it, especially in Kali Yuga. That's why there's always some new thing coming out on the market. <laughs> some new yogi, it's like, you know, yoga was very prominent back in the 70s. People were doing yoga, and yoga societies were, you know, opening up everywhere around the world. People were doing yoga. But after some time, they started to play around with the whole idea of yoga and started to introduce all kind of different crazy types of things into the yoga society. Have you ever heard of beer yoga? You can go, go on the internet and you'll find beer yoga, where they drink beer and do yoga at the same time. And they balance the bottle of beer on their head. I've seen it, I mean, it's not just a, there's beer yoga, sex yoga, this yoga, that yoga, laughing yoga. You go there and the guy just, he just makes you laugh and laugh and laugh, and everybody just laughs, nobody knows what they're laughing about. And it's called laughing yoga. So the whole idea is do something new. Take, I mean, we tried it in Krishna consciousness. People came into our movement and wanted to structure things around to make it a little bit interesting or different. Because, but Prabhupada's instructions were very strong. And he prevented that by speaking about that even before it happened. <laughs> Prabhupada was a pro prophetic person, he could actually understand what would be the future of my movement 
Therefore, he talked about one of the, well, all of the possible deviations that could possibly come up in the movement, just to show that when they do come up, it's a deviation. Yeah. So that's why Prabhupada was very expert at keeping things clear and direct. And because we, as long as we follow Prabhupada, we have no problem. There's no problem. So this is what you have in today's world. Hmm. Variety is of everything. I mean, now yogis, they get on their platform, they have their followers, and they even, they don't even believe in God. Yeah, they're like atheists. But they use yoga or various spiritual principles in order to get followers, get some powers, control people's minds, some shakti or something. <coughs> so that goes on. Kali Yoga. But if you stay with Srila Prabhupada, you'll see the beauty of this process as it unfolds even more and more. It's, it's so deep and profound. It's very, very deep. We generally are just just coming in to the surface of the water. Go deep. And that going deep means going deep into your chanting, going deep into the study of these books. Both, especially the chanting. The chanting will help you go deeper into the books. Because there's a lot of knowledge here. Like any one of these verses, we could speak about the same verse every day for like weeks and still give a different class. So, you know, all this knowledge is compressed within a particular verse or purport. And you can expand on it. Bhakti Siddhanta was the example. He spoke on the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam for three months straight every day for two hours in a place called Dhaka in East Bengal. And he didn't cover the same points each day. He was always expanding the meanings of the, that, that verse. And there was no purport to read from. It was just the verse, Janmad Yashistaha, meaning 111 in Bhagavatam. So that's an example <clears throat> of how expansive these verses are, how deep this knowledge is. So, uh, so go deep. If you go deep, it says that the big fish, there's big, there's fishes on the bottom of the ocean that people have never seen because they never come up. They stay on the very bottom of the ocean. The smaller fish is usually you know, swim to the top, but the big fishes stay on the bottom. And that's why they live their life out. The small fishes sometimes get caught by other fish or they, uh, or they get caught by the fishermen. So if you stay deep in Krishna consciousness, you're always, you know, in the best position. And that comes from two things. Uh, going deeper into your chanting, perfecting your chanting and perfecting and studying these books and understanding the different principles and dynamics of this philosophy. It's very deep. You can't exhaust it. It's just unlimited. <laughs> okay. So, is there anything else before we conclude? Thank you. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.